We've got a legend in the house, nine Grammy wins, best engineer nods, yeah. producer nods. Stay tuned, you're at the place, Pensado's place. <laughs> hey guys, great to have you back, man. It was a good week, right, Drew? Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I mean, what do we do different besides mix records every day? <laughs> well, that, uh, that, uh, and and, and the, uh, to quote to quote one of my favorite buddies, it, it was a good day, week. <laughs> <laughs> man, guys, uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time um, at this point in the show because I want to spend as much time with Joe as we possibly can. Joe Ciccarelli is our guest today, ooh, ooh. and um, when when Herb. Uh, first came up with a concept for doing a show and then the idea solidified and we kind of thought about what we were going to do. I think Joe was the first person, Herb, that I asked. I know it was one, it was, it was between yeah, him and Herb. three other people because we ran into each other at NAMM. Yep. Really and, I mean, not NAMM, but AES, AES up in up San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And um, there was, there was, Jimmy was there, Jimmy Douglas was there, and a couple other people were there. And I asked all of them, everybody said yes, Joe said yes, and, and uh, and then uh, we've been trying to work scheduling because Joe's the busiest guy in show business to get him on, and, and finally he's on, and, and, and I'm just so excited. He, he's, he's one of the first big-time engineers that gave me the, like, like just a, a hello in the hallway when I moved to L.A., and I've been grateful for him ever since. Joe Ciccarelli, everybody. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, let, let's, as, you, as we just discussed, you wouldn't do the intro until after we did the homework, but you did the intro anyways. But, oh. that, but that's classic, Dave. So let's do I thought a little, you said there wasn't any homework. Oh, you're talking about where to ride us and where to... Well, go ahead and do it, Herb. It's cool. So, this is Pensada's place. Thanks, Dave. So, Will, why don't you throw up the page? Uh, you know where to reach us. It's up there right now. Twitter us, Facebook. We've both been a bit jammed. We got a couple of things that are in the works, but we'll get back to you on our Facebook stuff as soon as we can. Um, you know, to see us at our YouTube page. If you want to tune in live, uh, it's 12 o'clock uh, Pacific on Thursdays, and you'll catch us on Justin TV. Uh, always thanks to our Vintage King partners who were responsible for a great show last week with. Peter Reardon, who has become oh, one of our favorites, yeah. um, and the response to the Shadow Hill stuff was great. But anyways, Vintage King, we love you, as you know. And in the chat room is our man Jeff Leibovich. There's yeah. his page up on the screen, answering your questions, taking care of you as usual. So, back to me, and with no further ado, since Dave's already introduced him, let's get to a great, great guest and welcome Joe Ciccarelli. Hey, Drew. Thank you. That was one of my better segues, and it got wasted, wasn't it? <laughs> I thought that was pretty slick. I mean, I, I went full on Charlie Rose on that and put nothing. But we might just have out of sequence. <laughs> <laughs> That's not unusual. You know what? You, you know what? You, you know stand what, up. We yeah. do. I, I, this is it. This is sit down. Sit down. Yeah. I know you're some kind of phony French Canadian, but right. in Spanish. Uh -huh. Uh, pensado means out of sequence. You know what it means in French? <laughs> yeah. oh, let's, let's keep that quiet. Keep that clean. You know we're but, being investigated by the FCC. We right. Gotta, we got to watch it now. But do you know what FCC stands for? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I did. It's something else in French. Let's not forget one other thing. In our chat room, he's uh, our CJ, not the DJ. Uh, Mr. Drew Adams. Yeah, Drew, make a point. How do you do? How do you do? Oh, that's a different kind of point. It's elegant. Oh. That's that elegant. Our Middle East there brethren. There is. Oh, oh, oh. Far sophisticated people oh, overseas. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so, anyways, all right, back to the matters at hand. Drew, I'm say Dave. hello to Dave. <laughs> Dave, say hello to Joe. <laughs> Joe, you see how formal we are. Okay. Joe, man. You know what? We, we were talking before when the, when the, man. Thanks for coming. I no, know you're man, so busy. I, he's got to actually cut. He's cutting a vocal today right after the show. A major artist too, and he's taking time out for us. No, I'm glad we got this together. We've been, yeah, <coughs> we've no been trying joke. to do it for no, so long. No, man, absolutely. Um, one of the most influential artists on me coming along was Frank Zappa, and of course the world knows that you did six Frank Zappa records well, and cut like your that. teeth yeah. with Frank. You wow. know, uh, several of the Joe's Garage records. Uh, Man, just incredible amount of work with Frank. And it hurts me because Frank is one of my heroes, uh, both as a guitar player and as an engineer and as a music aficionado. Um, that means somebody likes music, Drew. Noted. 
and it doesn't seem like Frank gets the hype he should these days or the respect. Is that just my imagination, or do you notice that there's kind of a Darth? I think it's going to take time, and I hope that what he gets noted for in the end is his classical compositions, because Ooh. there's a lot of stuff that's in the library that people haven't mm -hmm. heard that, to my ears, is is still not even ready for public consumption. It's so advanced, it's mm -hmm. so unique, that I think it's going to be like 50 years and people are going to hear this stuff and go, oh my god, this is still relevant. Almost like we look at Captain Beefheart now. Mm -hmm. When I listen to those albums, mm -hmm. to me, those sound hipper than anything being made now. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just his artistic uh, aesthetic. You think it'll is come in time, with Frank? I, I think so. I, I mean, because he had some of the greatest musicians ever. I mean, ever. Uh, his knack for finding. Steve Vai came up through that camp. Vinny uh, Kaliuta, yeah. Arthur Barrow, Peter Wolf, the keyboard player. They're yeah. all brilliant. Yeah. Um, by the way, guys, um, go to Spotify and grab. Is he on Spotify? You think? Good question. I don't know. If he's not on Spotify, I apologize. But go to your favorite. Um, source and, and grab a song called Hot Rats. Uh, that song was very influential on me in every Water level. Watermelon Easter Hay is my favorite. Yeah. And then Peaches and Regalia is Peaches my, my all-time yeah. favorite Frank Zappa song. Um, I get a lot of questions about how do you break in the business, how do you get access to the top artists, and all this kind of stuff. The way you and I did it was we just threw ourselves at the mercy of the cosmos and things just kind of worked out. Is there? Uh, I'm not the best person to ask for career guidance. <laughs> Herb, of course, it is. Herb, but uh, I read somewhere where you said basically you you never really tried to orchestrate a career. You just loved music. You loved music from the, from a very early age when your when your grandmother was playing classical records for wow, you. That's your research. And um, <laughs> that you never thought about a career. You just couldn't think of doing anything else. Pretty much. And I mean, that you, the money just follows and catches up with you at some point. Is that? No, it's really true. I mean, I played a bunch of bands, local bands in yeah. Boston where I grew up. Nothing ever amounted to anything. You said the B word, Herb. Is that okay with you? Oh, it's sorry. okay. No, it's cool. That's good. <laughs> you hate Boston? No, no, no. Uh, he hates Fox? Boston. Oh. He, hates, hate Boston. He, he, hates, he hates the it's Celtics. One of the teams uh, I have an issue with. Oh, man. Let's back to the <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's Great focus here. Let's focus here. All right. On the other side of <laughs> Anyways. Paul Pierce has been really cool in the negotiations for the NBA thing, so I, I appreciate that. And Garnett. Um, Anyways, back to the end. No, so, so I I, I, um, I wanted it to stay in music. I, I started as a bass player, and it never really happened for me. I, I just didn't have the patience to really practice, and I just wasn't that good, quite frankly. Oh, I can't you know? that. No, seriously, I wasn't. But anyways, um, I, I, so I, I had a cousin, like a second cousin, who had a studio, and I would hang out there just because I wanted to, you know, understand how records were made. I was always like that kid that, you know, studied the credits on the back yeah, of a, too. yeah, me you know, too. like, and you'd buy albums because they were on a certain label or a certain or producer or the artwork exactly it was psychedelic or whatever yeah. you know and um, so I wanted to stay in music and, and kind of was really fascinated with the process and um, ended up uh, then moving to LA and got a job at Cherokee as an assistant and I was 20 and six months nine months I was there I ended up on a Frank Zappa session, basically because I was the new guy at the studio. They would give me all the clients that worked long hours or oh, yeah. somebody thought were difficult. You know, sort of right of right. I, I was super enthusiastic sure. about you know just being in the studio. Period. So that's the moral of the story, yeah, right there. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So you know, Frank didn't matter. Roy Thomas Baker, all these people oh. that I worked with, and. Um, uh, so I, I just I lucked out and um, got a break through the, the studio system, let's call it, which doesn't really exist right. anymore. You mm -hmm. and I kind of came up yeah. same era, and that's yeah. the way you broke in. Now you have a Pro Tools rig at home. You record your friend's band, mm -hmm. and you know, something hopefully comes of it. I mean, that's maybe the way I got my first production gig mm -hmm. was by recording a friend's demo, mm -hmm. and uh, David Anderley, uh, at a &M, who was head of A&R at A&M, heard the demo, went, oh man, this is great, I want to sign this guy, and you know what, Th this is so good, we're going to put this out as an EP, and better still, I want you two guys to go in in a couple of months and start a full album, and you know what, wow. I like this so much, 
I want you to produce this other band that I have on my roster. That's Boingo, like that, Boingo. What's that drugstore in Hollywood where all yeah, the like stars? Schwab. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. like a Schwab exactly. drugstore story. No, I mean, it was. Story. I, I, I just I lucked out. I absolutely lucked out. That's fantastic. Well, guys, I, I, I want you to really follow what Joe's going to tell you today and share with you. Why? Because the man has won nine Grammys. <laughs> the man has been nominated for three Best Engineer of the Year awards. Three. One, he's won, I don't know how many he's won. He's won, I know he's won at least one. Uh, he's been, he's been, he's won the Producer of the Year Award. He's worked with the White Stripes. He's worked with Frank Zappa, Beck, Bon Jovi, uh, Counting Crows, uh, one of my favorites, Morning Jackets, on and on and on. You too. We went over this, but uh, Elton John, Beck. Um, when he talks, listen, I'm telling you, there's a lot of wisdom in this man. Uh, he's not fully aware of it, but he's inspired me in a number of ways in my career. So uh, if that means anything to you, pay attention to what he says. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go to to my. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this. Herb knows this, but I went to the Barbara Walters School of Interviewing. It's a little closet over in Pacoima, uh, but at the Barbara Walters School of Interviewing, they taught us to ask questions like, "You said once that nothing has sounded good since 1972." I knew I'd get busted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, I'm teasing you, Joe, because I know what you meant. Yeah. You, of course, you're not talking about engineering or sounds yeah. or anything. Just the emotion and records back then was different than now. It was a different time. Social no, issues I, were different. I, I really believe that was sort of, you know, if every art form has its seminal period, its golden mm -hmm. age, that that was the period for, mm -hmm. for pop record making. Mm -hmm. And that there was something about the the culture where music was at the forefront of everything mm -hmm. and people uh, inspired other people just like we were talking earlier about art movements you know there was this thing where people competed against each other obviously the the stories of the beach boys competing against the the beatles and the the, the stones and, and the beatles and yep. and something about that era those are the albums that all of us even people that are making Britney Spears records are real, mm -hmm. you know, sort of produced pop records mm -hmm. that everybody wants to emulate the, the kind of emotional intent of those records from that yeah. period, from 67 to 72. Yeah, we all stand in this profession of ours on, on somebody's shoulders, and in, uh, those are from that time period good shoulders to stand on, mm -hmm. and that, that in no way implies that some of what's going on now isn't equally as good or as great because I, I I personally believe some of the greatest music that's ever been made is being made now. Some of the worst music that's ever been made is being made now. But um, you you kind of um, you, you you said that um, there's a distinction between old school and retro, which which uh, is a way of redeeming yourself from that hideous 1970s two state. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I think I think the seventies worked because we ha had a great match between our drugs and the music. I'm not sure sober some of that sounds. I listened to old Quicksilver the other day sober, and it didn't quite have the same effect as it had in '72. Uh -huh. And that's in no way a, an endorsement for drugs. Drugs are bad. What's that? South Park. Mm -hmm. Um. But but that that, that statement is, uh, between old school and retro kind of hit me like a sledgehammer. I'm like, golly, why did I think of that? That's brilliant. Hmm. I mean, to me, the old school thing, I think it always points to the song and the artist as being the focal point, you know, where mm -hmm. retro sometimes, in my mind, is almost for the sake of being retro, and mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's disingenuine, perhaps. Man, what a great way to put it. That's so true. It's an attempt to be an homage exactly. as opposed to yeah. being really serving connected. Serving the song, which yeah. is what we really do, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I think that the times that, that I, I uh, have hit the mark, and I, I feel there are very few, uh, are, are oh, when you, you dive deep into the song. You know, I mean, yeah. I, always, I always feel like, you know, as great as a song is, it's about the artist's emotional commitment to that song. Mm -hmm. And I think we, as, as servants to that artist, servants to that song, 
the best work we do is when we dive in deep, you know, it mm -hmm. was the Peter Gabriel digging in the dirt, you know. Mm -hmm. I think the more you put 110% of your being into that song and find what is great about it and bring that to the forefront, that's when you do your best work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about microphones or plugins or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's it's really about an emotional commitment, at least for me it is. One thing's, one thing's Cause that, I don't know what I'm one doing thing's struck me about <laughs> When I first moved out here, Herb's the first person I met out here, basically, huh. and, uh, well, first person I stalked, I guess I should put yeah. it. I met might be a little bit of an overstatement. <laughs> we stalked each other. And um, I was under the impression that you just had to take anything that came through the door to get your foot in the door. and. and and uh, it worked okay, but later on I had to get more selective because I realized that sometimes I was putting myself where I wasn't wanted or where my gifts didn't dovetail correctly or fit right. And that rejection uh, just made me want to go grab a 30-06 and find a tower somewhere and take pot shots at people. Uh, I'm, I don't handle rejection very well. And one of the things about your career that's impressed me and that I, I learned from you early on was the fact that um, you tend to put yourself where you feel something for the song, the music, the people involved, and you pick your projects because you get offered a ton of things, but you pick your projects where you feel the most needed and you don't necessarily feel a need to inflict your sound, but you try to immerse yourself in the creative process of what you're working with and, and amplify that from within outward. And, and in the process you have a sound, but you don't start by inflicting your sound. Your sound is that you try to bring out everything good about the song or the music. I mean, to me, that's that's the job. It, Can that work in today's climate? Uh, um, it's the only way I know how to make records. I, I don't, mm. I mean, I, I don't, I hope I don't have a sound. I hope I don't, uh, you know, have a stamp that I put on anything. I hope I'm there to, you know, commit to that project. And, mm. um, man, I think From that's the From my perspective as a fan, uh, your sound is just quality. It's, 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 it's... Well, you're kind. I mean, because you, you believe in using every card in the deck. He's, he's one of these guys, Herb, that, that, and if everybody's doing analog and he thinks the digital environment's going to work best for the song, it's digital. If the opposite is true. Whatever works good. If, and sometimes Joe will make decisions, not necessarily sonically, but creatively. So in other words, if, if an artist isn't quite ready or if an artist, um, if he gets the impression that the song's going to require a lot of manipulation, he might choose the digital format so that he has access to better editing as opposed to the analog format, which might be better sonically. He, he always goes for the sound and the... Well, he, it seems to me that, and tell me if, if we're correct, it, it's about being slavish to the ode of, of, the, of the song. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's about that commitment. Mm -hmm. And whatever that commitment requires, am I, is that? And, I, and, and you put it better than I did. Absolutely. Gotcha. And gotcha. I think you choose your, your studios, your gear, your musicians, your overall aesthetic based on that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the thing I try to do with every, you know, what we're talking about is a producer and, and as an engineer, mm -hmm. too. You know, I, I try to do my homework on a project yeah. and understand the artist's past, understand the new demos they've sent me. Mm -hmm. Try to figure out what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, mm -hmm. what I can kind of shore up and what I need to bring out because that's what people identify. I mean, I guess it's like being like this kind of fan. Like you have to sure. sort of be the, the, a fan of we, the artist and of the music. We see this on the show. I mean, you know, oftentimes uh, 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 we'll come in with guests yeah. and because we research them, they're so appreciative that we've researched it, you get another layer of commitment from them in the interview. You know, just because you've mm -hmm. cared and you show, yeah. so it's got to work in the studio. Yeah. I don't, with the artistic. I don't system. remember ha saying half the stuff, that I said, <laughs> but I know I said it. Oh, we got we got piles of information on you. <laughs> I, I just make that stuff up. You say, yeah. but um, I'm I'm gonna run something by you. This is this is my part of the show where I get to get to ask personal questions. A lot of times, people ask me like, um, I don't want my mix over polished. So I started thinking the other day, well, what if I wanted to polish a mix? What would I do to polish a mix, Joe? <laughs> I don't know how to how to make a mix not polished. So I guess that means but I'd sure like to know how to polish a lot it. of 15k. I don't know. I don't know what that I don't means. know. I wish I knew how to polish a mix. 
her make a note of that. Mm -hmm. Teach Dave how to polish a mix. Actually, you know, the good thing is if you could come up with a product like mix polish, you know, you just <laughs> spray it on. Add that to the twizzle flanger. <laughs> the twizzle flanger. <laughs> but um, part of the thing that led me to thinking about that was recently a couple of my, my close friends have, have encouraged me to, to go through a self-imposed austerity and time limit thing because I've been working out of my project studio and um, I, I realized that sometimes having all the time in the world isn't a good thing and like when you were working on the white stripes uh, you, you, you had the, the fun task of mixing 15 songs in five days but 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 those mixes were incredible and, and you, you mentioned that part of that was because you you had to go with your gut your first instincts uh, can you expand on that a little bit as a as a technique that we might well, add to our repertoire? I mean that that whole project was was a challenge and and fun. First of all, Jack. I, I mean, I have as much respect for Jack as I do for Frank Zappa. I mean, Jack is is a Renaissance man. Jack Jack is just full of talent, and uh, his thing. And I've, I've said this before, is he understands performance. He mm. understands that what people react to on a record is performance, is that gut emotional thing that you connect with. Mm -hmm. And he'll do everything possible to preserve that. In other words, when something feels good to him, he won't polish it. Mm. He won't tuck in the corners. Man, if it has that thing mm. where it makes you jump up and down, or maybe something's too loud, something's too soft, maybe something's missing from the mix, <laughs> <laughs> it's done. It's done. And, and there were so many times during that mixing that album where I would just be getting faders up and he'd be lying on the couch in the back of the room like, man, it sounds great, print it, print it. <laughs> I mean, like, no, Jack, give me, give me another hour, really, seriously, give me another hour. No, 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 really, print it, I'm telling you, print it right now, print it right now. Yeah. You know, maybe, it's brilliant. I wonder, if, I wonder if maybe we should start printing something every like three or four hours you know, and then go, I, I've never done that, but I'm thinking seriously When about, I first started, a lot of the, the producers that I worked with would, would do that to me. They would walk mm -hmm. in the room early on and say, look, I know know you you're you're a tweakaholic you're gonna sit there and tweak every little tiny thing to mm -hmm. death put a version down right now and you know I, I gotta tell you there must be at least a dozen what am I talking about probably 20 30 rough mixes that I've made that have Wait, ended up this away from your mic just so it's oh, yeah. tragic. there you go uh, there's probably been about 20, 30 rough mixes that I've done over the years that have ended up on, mm -hmm. on albums. In fact, my favorite one was uh, a Rufus Wainwright cut that Greg oh. Wells and I did together. Oh, wow. And the, the, best, the best thing was that Lenny Warnker, who I adore, one of the mm -hmm. best a yeah. men ever, that, that's for sure. came into the room and heard this and uh, had a balance up on the console. And Lenny was like, the track is phenomenal this is just just really really great you know uh, will you do me a favor w will you put a, a rough mix down I promise I won't play it for anybody I just love to hear it I just want to I'll play it in the car I won't play it for anybody so I, one of your Grammy nominations no not quite but <laughs> I got a quick balance and I was like okay it went over hit hit record on the CD burner or I think we dumped it at Pro Tools too and um, I, I turned the monitor down and went, so Lenny, how, how's Joey, how's Anna, how's the kids, how's everybody? Mm -hmm. And then I you know, heard back and I went, oh, excuse me, let me, let me make the fade here. That was, the, that was the rough mix. So we further worked on the track, did some other tweaks, some background mm -hmm. vocals, did the final mix, which I knew, I was smart enough to know that, okay, Lenny likes this. He called in. He loves this. Right. I can't go too far from this. But so I made it sound like what is, in my mind, a record. You know, mm. polished it more. And um, you know, he got the final mix and said, "Final mix sounds really good." 
But you know, I gotta tell you, there's something about <laughs> that rough mix. Exactly. I said I'd never play again. I've been playing eight thousand times an hour. Exactly, exactly. And you know, a flat rough mix made it onto the record. There's there's a a story of band that was actually one of it was a, a difficult project, but one of one of my favorite experiences ever. Uh, a band called American Music Club that I did about oh, 15 yeah. years ago mm -hmm. for uh, Warner Brothers. Mark Eitzel, one of the greatest songwriters ever, one of the greatest still undiscovered songwriters. But um, I mean, I adore him. Just, just songs rip your heart out. Just repeat amazing. the name of the album again. Uh, it was American Music Club, American and the name Music of the album Club. was San Francisco. Okay. Um, but you know, I did a bunch of rough mixes when we just about finished overdubs for the band. And um, a few days later, after I gave the band the rough mixes, they all said, we need to sit down and talk. I was like, okay, sure. You know, is this how you see the album sounding? I was like, well, yeah, we've been working on it for a few months now. We're close to completion. Well, we've got to talk about these rough mixes. I, I don't think things are right. I was like, yeah, of course. Whatever you wanted to change, we'll change. And, you know. Wow, whatever engineer wants to hear. Right, exactly. But it, but it was sort of like, oh, boy, you know, what do I do? I want to keep these guys happy and everything. And um, the funny thing is that in the end, I don't know how many of those rough mixes made it to the album. A number of them made it to the album. Mm. And it was sort of, they captured a spirit. And yes, they're raw. Maybe this wasn't loud enough, that wasn't loud enough. Maybe every band member didn't get their say. Maybe they missed the mark totally. And some point, like Jim Scott ended up mixing a lot of the record, did an amazing job, amazing job. Mm. And, um, uh, you know, the, the funny thing is that there is something about that when you, don't think too much when you are limited with time, when you just go for, from, from your heart, from your gut, like, this feels good, wow, oh, this is exciting. Just like saying the White Stripes thing, mm -hmm. man, press record. And I'm not always smart enough to catch myself in those moments. Mm -hmm. And I go, oh, gee, but that one background harmony could come up. And mm -hmm. you know what? The two guitars in that second verse aren't exactly balanced. Mm -hmm. And you get it all tucked mm -hmm. in nice. And at the end of the day, you go, that's nice. Well, <laughs> we fight that. What makes us good engineers is also our, our uh, what makes us suck sometimes. Exactly. Joe, um, you and I are kindred spirits in the sense that um, we both we both really believe violently in the relationship between art and music and the creativity that can be found in one medium like architecture, art can be applied to mm -hmm. another medium like music. Um, how how uh, I know I know you could write a novel or, or this could be a whole lecture series, but enlighten the audience like 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 how you use. An experience at the museum to make you a better uh, producer or engineer or mixer. Sometimes it might even be. Oops, um, sometimes it, it might even be the uh, simplicity of seeing a photograph and how somebody captured light and how maybe the uh, content of the photograph is very simple, but it's just shadow or the setting or whatever and it makes me think like whoa focus maybe I need to focus more on the um, the vocal or the guitar or whatever that key element is it's almost like for me it's almost like oblique strategy cards you know mm -hmm. you see a a Kubrick film and you see his attention to detail and how his lighting is just impeccable from scene to mm. scene and then you know you start to think like wow well, maybe you know I need to start to think a little bit more about how these acoustic guitars mm. sit in and how they affect other things mm. and I, I don't know I, I just always think you, you look to the highest art form you know that you can look to and and try to bring that to pop music, you know, which yeah. is really a very ephemeral, crass, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just because you can type a hundred words a minute doesn't mean you're going to write a great novel. Just because you can EQ the piss out of a kick drum doesn't mean you're going to have a great mix. Sometimes you have to have life experiences. Sometimes you have to have uh, a passion about something. Some of the greatest music ever made 
is great because nothing other than the fact that that person had a passion for uh, an environmental cause or a passion for a religious cause or a passion for yeah. an anti-religious cause or but 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 passion is necessary and life experiences are necessary and without having something to type there's no point in typing and I That's think right. I think I think what you're saying possibly if I can paraphrase is is that the inspiration that you got from that particular piece of art or, or, or building or whatever uh, the creativity that, that produced that can be applied to the creativity that we use towards mixing for something as simple as the rule of thirds so the way our eyes directed like you said around a, a great painting or, or around a you can do that in the in the mix spectrum too yes I also think that, that, that at some level it's about being curious you know you just he hunger said, to, uh, to 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 find out why and to yeah. sort of dig in and and that process interests you most of the businessmen that I sort of admire and follow they just ask a thousand questions. Yeah. They're just, they're like children. Yes. They're so curious, and yeah. then it turns into innovation. Yeah, uh, so it's, I, and I, find I, it I do. I think it's bringing life experiences. I mean, the one thing I'm a big believer in, I mean, you talk about people getting started in the business. I, I think you, you listen to every kind of music mm -hmm. you can get your hands on. And, you know, like people are like, I, I want to do electronic music, or I want to do rock and roll, and they tend to live in that world and live in that world only. I think when you start to go and listen to some Absolutely. Banda record or classical piece of Absolutely. music or, or a bagpipe orchestra or whatever, mm. I think mm. you start to think like, wow, look at the way they mm. harmonize mm. things and mm. look at the, what the, the song forms are different mm. and mm. You, they creep into your subconscious and you bring that mm. into what you do. I, I think that's crucial. That keeps yeah. me going because I One think if I had to I do, the same thing. Whenever I get stumped and I feel like I'm getting stale, I'll go listen to what's going on in the dance world. like like. Uh, noisy Skrillex or, yeah, or Mouse yeah. or some of those guys, they got incredible ideas that can be applied to what mm -hmm. we do. I don't, know, I don't know any really consistently hit producer who doesn't have varied taste, hmm. who isn't influenced by different yeah. things and they interpret it a certain way. And you can't get that unless you're willing to reach out. I and one, of the, one yeah. of the issues I find with sort of the current or younger crop of folks coming up is that tools allow you to get in a box and stay in it. And you've got to force yourself out of the box and then apply those yeah. tools in new ways. Yeah. You know, it's, it's the greats eventually leave, though. Have you noticed that? Yeah, like they definitely get that curiosity. Like the first thing they do is they want to experiment with a live bass or a live hi hat. Right. The first thing they do, <laughs> and then that, then then they want to do a, you know, then then like you, you run into them two years later, and then what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing a live string mm -hmm. section. Yeah, mm -hmm. live strings is like. Mm -hmm. That's the that's Nirvana for a young producer. Mm -hmm. It's still Nirvana for me. Every time I, uh, I get in the room with a string section, yeah. that's like it's you, so as powerful. a kid, I used to. I grew up in Boston, mm -hmm. that so I would go to. They used to do this thing where every Tuesday afternoon, I think it was, you could go in to watch the Boston Symphony Orchestra oh, or the Boston Pops rehearsal yeah. for yeah. free. I used to see those on PBS. You could sit in the Symphony Hall and just look for free. 50 people, 100 people oh, in there what a great for free. Experience. And the sound of a 60, 100 piece Symphony Orchestra, Incredible. that's heavy metal, dude. Yeah. That's right. You know, that's yeah. that's a big sound. That's right. Yeah. That's, right. that's for me, awesome. For me, you, you're going to laugh, but what I enjoyed the most about those moments was when they tuned up. Yeah, exactly. Tuning up was the coolest sound. I, I always wanted to start a record like that, uh, you know. But but can, see, the weird thing is that when I do a string date, that moment where all the string players are trying to find their A, it's just like I want to. I turn the monitor down all the time. It's like there's a sort of thing in my mind, like how do they do that? How can they find? The same A when so seventeen the people yeah. are doing this. Well, you know, Quietus has kept the violin sections don't. They tend to play sharp if you really well, analyze yeah, it, so they can hear themselves. Yeah. You know, right. yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah. but that all works out. I well, know. Is that amazing? Look, that's that's always the <laughs> um, mystery. A little quick, a little quick piece for our guys that that are that are following and hanging on every word. Last week, Joe, we did a thing on distortion, and uh, going back to the white stripes. Um, 
you, you kept getting requests for more and more and more distortion on the vocal, and at some point, I, I can't remember what song it was, but it might not have been the Stripes, but you actually used a futz box, one of the things we talked about. So, so guys, what I'm showing you is good stuff here. You know, I think you you went and used a, a, an LA two. I just cranked yeah, up the tubes. Yeah, a lot. Tubes, we did know? a lot of that. We did a lot of like V76, V72 overloads. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was uh, 1073 mic pre all the way up. Oh wow, uh, that's a different color. Yeah, yeah, sure. and and was uh, I, there was one thing I, I ended up doing on most of Jack's vocals, which was a guitar amp in the room with him singing mm -hmm. through a guitar mm -hmm. amp that we ended up getting it to feed mm -hmm. back into the bo vocal microphone wow. itself. So mm -hmm. Kind yeah, of convoluted I, setup. I use a lot of plugins for that now, but also just take a moment to, to, to give a little plug for our buddy Ralph and Colin over at McDSP. That Futz box is just a sweet piece of it, gear. It really is. In yeah. fact, I think their plugins were the first thing you ever bought. Wasn't that, this is this is true story. I mean, I told Colin this that in 99 or whenever I bought my first Pro Tools system, I started to play with the plugins and I was, you know, being a real diehard analog guy, mm -hmm. I was hating Pro Tools but knew I had to jump into it. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't find a plugin that made sense to me and everybody was like, well, you have to get compressor bank and filter bank. That's the, mm -hmm. the, the, the only plugins mm -hmm. that you should get. And to this day, I still use filter bank as on, I would say, 70% of my vocals. You know, there's mm. something about the air in that yeah, plugin. Yeah, 6 is just a sweet yeah, sound. Exactly, of exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I just wanted you to um, start to warm your arm up here, bud. Uh, have I got time for another question? You got time for another question? That's Bowers Boss, and I'm going to keep messing with you. Oh, just, geez, just, I'm no, so no, you're bad. Good. You're good. It's not your fault. No, no track. We just didn't want um, to. No, no, no. You said something, and, and I felt like, God, if there's ever been a timely quote, it's now. You said that mixing now is more about refining, not reinventing. Uh, no, you didn't say it that way. You said that the mix said, process. Mixing is about politics. It's not about music. <laughs> yeah, <that's for> sure. <laughs> which is really what it is. That's more that's real. The, sure. climate, <laughs> climate, the climate with which you said that was was you track it, you, the tracking is really done right, it's done well, and then the mix process is, then becomes one of refining rather than reinventing. And I thought, man, what an accurate statement for the climate today because so many people, like we've talked before, guys, uh, so many people spend so much time on their rough mixes. My job is not to reinvent anything anymore like it was in the 90s. That's now it's about right. refining, and I felt like... Michael Brown and I were just talking about the same yeah. thing the other day. Yeah. It really is, it's about just finalizing maybe is a good word you know next time you talk to michael he's one of the show's favorites he, he was on, on awesome. very early on in the show i learned i learned so much from michael i never thought about i've always had a problem with compression i'm just just a lot of it's voodoo to me because i would take it off and it always sound better because i come from the live world i love dynamics oh, right, i was right, playing right. in bands until yeah, i was yeah. 35 and and live is all about dynamics yes. you know the guy's about to put a piece of food in his mouth at the club and you wait for that moment and then the full band comes in, the lights Bam. go wide and then you watch him spill food. That was a night for us, you know? But, um, um... Let's tee it up. Okay, you ready, Joe? Yeah, go. So this is our little batter's box mm -hmm. session that we talked about and Dave is the pitcher. Um, we have some pitcher nicknames for him, but we don't, we'll, we'll tell you those after the show. So throw up the first one. Okay, Joe, uh, vocals. Uh... Pultec. Okay. Um, live snare. Mm. As opposed to a dead snare. I don't know why yeah, I do that yeah, all exactly. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about board. Uh, API. 550? 550. Or 512. That's my favorite snare. Is it 512 or 513? Uh, 512 is the preamp. Yeah. 312 is my favorite preamp. I, I like on snare, I like the 512, but. Mm. Okay. Um, I'm going to send you a little curveball here, Joe. Okay. Get ready. 808. DBX 160. Perfect. Oh, man, right. where's my buzzer? Where, one out of three. Where's my damn buzzer? <laughs> I, I, I can't do that again. We are, uh, background vocals. Mm, uh, could be... Focus right, focus right EQ, maybe focus right compressor plugins even. Okay, I like that sort of stuff. Uh, acoustic guitar. Many different styles, but I have to give one answer. Uh, LA3A. Oh, that's my go-to. 
I like that on, on uh, synth pianos too. Hmm. Uh, speaking of pianos, give me an acoustic piano. Neve 33609. Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, uh, a compressor, I might add, that's fallen a little bit out of popularity, but still one of the top five compressors ever made. The Neve? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I can't use it on a stereo bus, but, but a great, no. great yeah. box. Um, bass. Bass guitar. 1073. Oh, cool. Uh, th I can't wait to hear this one. Uh, room mics on a drum kit. I know you use 8,000 room mics, so yeah, that's a tough 8, question for you to narrow yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, uh, the one piece of outboard gear, maybe maybe a, a SSL compressor, a smart oh. compressor. Oh, the Allen Smart C2? Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe Chandler compressor. I've got to use the Chandler. I noticed you mentioned that Zener a lot. is awesome. Um, strings. You can take your choice of synth or live. Mm. Outboard gear, nothing. You know, to me, uh, mm. I mean, I guess if I'm mixing, what do I put on? Um, you know, um, it's all about the air with strings, and it's about the reverb. So it might even be, like, sometimes I like the SSL 15K stuff. Sometimes oh, yeah. the zip of that cuts them through the mix. Mm. Sometimes it's just a, it's a 140 that saves the day, an EMT 140 that saves the day. Oh, man. You know? um. And this is an impossible one to answer, so just choose electric guitar. Impossible one to answer. Uh, 1176. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, you're done. You passed. How did I do her? How did I do? Did well. And now what? Were did you I doing? win that or did he win it? Joe won. He got it. <coughs> you did I'm well. Just saying that because I'm the guest. No, no, no. You did well. I, no, I. You know we. We embarrass each other on the show, so you just won. We so, did. Drew, you got to. So, where are the, can I see the answers? What are the, what are the answers, the real answers? Yes, no, yes, yes, no. <laughs> right, exactly. no true, A, B, false, C, true, false, true, yes. false. Uh, A, all of the above. Yeah, you did pretty good. <laughs> you've been admitted. You got into school. <laughs> Drew, how's the. Uh, you got a couple questions in corner office? I do. I do. We got a graphic. There we go. Great. All right. First up, from Daniel Taylor, uh, expanding on all your Zappa projects that you've worked on. Uh, Daniel Taylor Mitchell asks, what was something you took from the sessions with Zappa that you still find applicable in your work today? I guess just the uh, main thing. I, I took a lot from Frank. I mean, th for, for me, the thing about Frank was that he pushed the limits at uh, every opportunity. There was no rules. Uh, the, the thing I, ha I, I, I learned the most from him was to unlearn everything I had learned <laughs> up to that point in my life, yeah. to just throw it all away. By the way, Daniel, uh, thanks a lot. I, I, I noticed you're pretty active on, uh, on Facebook. We appreciate that. Man. Drew, and, got uh, We got uh, Ludwig, Lud I always say this wrong, Ludwig Diaz. Yeah, Ludwig's another one of our, our faithful guys. We yeah. have regulars. He says, uh, he says, I'm aware you have worked with several well-known Latin artists such as Juan Nez, Cafe Tacuba, I'm not Spanish, I know I look like it, but <laughs> what, has, good, <laughs> thanks, what has been your experience working with Latin artists? What elements you found that were unexpected or changed your approach to mixing? Uh, Great question, by the way. Yeah, very good. You know, the, the, I love working on a lot of Latin projects because the thing... The feeling, uh, the emotion. The emotion, is at, that's what it's all about, is mm -hmm. the emotion. But the other thing, too, is that they do this Latin pop, Latin rock especially, does this brilliant synthesis between the traditional music that they grew up listening mm -hmm. to and what we know as man. modern pop music. Yeah, what a good, good, so, great observation. Yeah, man, it, it, it's so unique to me. It's, mm -hmm. it's so almost cut and paste Some collage. Having influences that make their way into the process. Yeah, that's that's, that's exciting about that. to me. That's really exciting to me. Well yeah. done. Well done, Latin community. I'm yes, proud. absolutely. We got time for one more? One more, Drew. All righty. Um, Joe, what's your thought process when arranging as far as producing? Uh, do you follow a general scheme or something totally different? Well, that's a tough one just because it's really dependent on the song mm -hmm. and the artist. Uh, the one thing I always do is a lot of pre-production, meaning, you know, banging it out in a rehearsal room with the band and really trying stuff. I, I like to really, especially with bands, kind of have a 
uh, an open forum for a few weeks of pre-production where mm -hmm. you can walk in and go, hey, let's try this kind of bass and drum groove. Let's try this kind of song structure and try a bunch of things, get a lot of stuff out of the way. So when you get into the studio, it becomes about performance, you know, and just right. killing it. And uh, I like to get the sort of mechanical stuff out of the way in pre-production. Mm. That's mm. cool. That was from City. Thanks, City. Good, good question, uh, Drew Herb. What, what, what's the guy with the big teeth? Oh, Tony, Tony Robbins. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm gonna, I want to do something. I've never. This, this is gonna make sense, Herb. No, no, I'm sure Bear it is. I just didn't know Tony you, as. You have a book and a lifestyle and philosophy that you're gonna put for us now. Uh, uh, no, as a matter of fact, you are. I, I, I always, I always sum up the show with with something uplifting, some kind of philosophical thing. But, but man, there's nobody more prepared to inspire our audience than you. So I'm, I'm going to give you the Tony Robbins moment in in the show today. Wow. If you just look into your camera and and tell our audience, just give them something uplifting like you've done in your interviews and like you've done for me. Man, I would say um, maybe we went through it before, but eat, drink, sleep love music and if if you don't love it nowadays just don't do it there you go amen here's amen. a question for you uh, wait a minute that, 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 was, that was the wonderful ending moment of the show now yeah, i gotta do something because i do too we're, we're not done yet and he also we also need to get him out i gotta question come is, to rehearse will you, will you yeah you, do. you really do will you come back oh man this was a pleasure you kidding me thank you so much uh, uh, great to I'll see I'll you talk. again this was great yeah, i'm, I'm sorry so that i haven't done it soon no, well, well, listen. We're, we're happy that you didn't because that means you've been busy. We're happy to have you back. So, Anytime. The, the so opportunity is yours. Just no, call. This is great. You can wrap it up. But, you know, before we go, I think we should mention yesterday, I don't know in life that you often live and see this kind of greatness and innovation. So we lost, um, really, Thomas Edison oh, yeah, yesterday. So, yeah. you know, and in our space now, we come from music, and now we found ourselves in a kind of a tech place thanks mm -hmm. to the audience and this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it would be important that we mentioned Stephen Jobs and how, yeah, what an incredible expand, thing. If I can expand on that, Herb, I, I was reading some of his quotes. Uh, a, a lot of the quotes he's known for, Herb, you guys go look up because they're, 100% applicable to what we do, and they're an extension of what Joe just said in terms of his Tony Robbins moment. So, uh, did you, did you, you know, can you remember any of the quotes that Jobs had? Um, they were, they some were of them, spectacular. I think it's more interesting like to do Something with, about live your life like you know you're going to die or yeah, something. Yeah, he, he made the commission speech at Stanford, but I think your exercise is better. You guys go look. There's so much information out around him now. Just remember this. The guy went to, went to college for one semester. Uh, started a couple companies, started Pixar, did Apple, went to Next, brought that back. That's passion and innovation and belief and risk and going for it. And it's just, well it's just absolutely well changed our lives. So, well you know, we love you. We'll be back next week. Dave usually closes, but we're saying goodbye. All right, guys. Uh, see you next week. Go back and play this episode over again and, and really, really, really dive into what Joe said. Research them on the web, research them in the record store and Spotify. Uh, like me, you'll learn a lot by listening to his records. There's something unique and special going on in what he does. And I want to be a part of that, and I think you guys do too. See you next week.